Good morning. Good morning and welcome to Finance Panel and the Finance Panel, I suppose. In English, my name is Per Wiesen. I'm head of the Institute for Financial Research, uh, research institute affiliated to the Stockholm School of Economics. Uh, and together we, with SNS, we do this seminar series. Uh, and this particular morning seminar today has been in the making almost a year, as far as I'm concerned. Between Christmas and New Year's last year, I read a fascinating article in the Financial Times. So, you know, one of these articles that pieces of the puzzle fall in place and you understand things you haven't understood before. And it was written by a certain Sergei Gurev, who, whom I at that time had never heard of before, but I was deeply impressed by that article. And I talked to Per Strömberg, who is, sits in the room next to mine, and, and asked him sort of, and he knew you very well, and so we wrote you an email saying, could you please come to Stockholm? We'd sort of like to do a seminar on this. And you had a heavy teaching load, so it was not impossible before the summer, but we agreed on after the summer. And now it's certainly after the summer. Uh, so that's how it happened. Uh, for those of you who, like myself a year ago, do not know exactly who Sergei Gureyev is, he's a, presently a professor of economics, at Sciences Po in Paris. Uh, he, has, he has a PhD in economics from the Russian Academy of Sciences. He was a rector for the New Economic School in Moscow, 2004 to 14. And very recently, he was appointed uh, chief economist uh, at EBRD, the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, starting sometime next summer, according to the press release I, uh, I read after the spring teaching, I would assume. Uh, so, Sergei, we are extremely happy to have you here. And I understood that all of Stockholm immediately embraced you. So you have sort of full schedule of meetings while you are here. And, and we are very happy to have you here. You are very well. Also, we should say that if you have questions, comments, whatever, Sergei is happy to take them as we go along. That's more the academic way of doing things. And so please, Let's have a dialogue about these things, and we will end it not later than 9.15. We are always, always careful with that, so you can go to your work, whatever it might be, and have a 9.30 meeting, if you like. Sergei, please. Uh, and uh, in that sense, please treat it as my personal views and uh, do not attribute them to uh, Iberdi. So um, uh, I will I will uh, talk about I will talk about uh, recent developments in the Russian economy because I think it is important to understand uh, what uh, to understand what's going on right now. In order to understand that, you need to also to go back a little bit. Uh, at least uh, 10 or 15 years to see what's happened before. And this is what I'm going to talk about, uh, about uh, the first uh, nine or 10 years of uh, uh, Putin's government, uh, then what happened, briefly say what happened in 2009, what happened in the next few years, and then uh, I'll talk about slowdown, which started in 2012, and the recession, which started in 2014-15. So, uh, this is this is the chart of Russian quarterly GDP growth. Uh, you see uh, several things on this chart. One is how dramatically the growth rates went up uh, exactly at the point when Mr. Putin was appointed prime minister in August 2000, in August 1999, and then president year 2000, and then until the very moment of uh, uh, financial crisis in 2008, a Russian economy was growing on average at seven percent a year. This is uh, quite quite an achievement. Russia has never had a growth period uh, like this. Uh, I think the, the, the closest uh, second would be 1930s industrial, industrialization by Stalin, where millions of people died. And yet, at that point, growth rate uh, was still something like 6% or 
Now, uh, then financial crisis comes, uh, Russia declines, but Russian economy declines in annual terms by 8 percentage points, and you see that in some quarters uh, decline was something like 11 or 12 percent. So it was a, among major economies, it was most hit was the biggest the biggest uh, hit in uh, G20 and then it started to recover it recovered at 4% a year for a couple of years it recovered all the losses during the crisis and then the growth rate sometime in the second half of uh, uh, 2012 started to slow down and slow down pretty much to zero and then uh, foreign policy initiatives ideas started and uh, recession also followed so let me go through that so uh, one of the things which uh, people think about when they talk about the growth of the first 10 years of Mr. Putin, uh, they think about oligarchs, rich Russians, uh, they think about people buying football clubs outside of Russia, but actually the growth has trickled down to everybody. If you look at the numbers for billionaires and wealth inequality, it is high. Uh, so Russia now has fewer billionaires than China, but it's still has, uh, in terms of concentration of wealth, uh, Russian billionaires control a greater share of GDP uh, than a in any other country. America has whatever, 500 billionaires, but they together control 10, 15% of GDP, depending on the year. In Russia, now, uh, this 100 billionaires control 20% of GDP, and in mid-2000s, or right before the crisis, this number was even higher, uh, about 30%. So, and uh, there is, there is an uh, annual publication by Credit Suisse uh, Research Institute called Global Wealth Report. In this uh, uh, publication, they try to estimate wealth inequality, and Russia is an absolute champion, uh, if you want, in these terms. Uh, Gini coefficient of wealth inequality, according to uh, this, uh, this research uh, by two leading scholars of wealth inequality, uh, Jim Davis and Tony Shorrox, uh, is uh, above 90 percent. And again, countries with similar income levels, countries which are richer, uh, countries which are poorer, they don't come uh, too close to that. And you see the world as a whole is close, Ukraine is close, but uh, even the U.S., which is now portrayed as the country of high wealth inequalities, is not close. But if you look uh, beyond the very rich, you still see that growth did benefit everybody. So if you look at unemployment and poverty rates, you see that unemployment, which was somewhere at 14%, uh, in 1999 came down to 5%, and even now unemployment is staying at 5%. This is uh, something which, of course, in Europe people watch very closely. In Russia it is actually a bit less important because there are some jobs which are similar to uh, unemployment in terms of both uh, job description and, and uh, compensation. Uh, but uh, still, the fact is that uh, it used to be 14 percent and now it's it's more like five percent if you look at poverty rates this is also a dramatic improvement so if you look in uh, 1999 uh, the poverty rate the count of people who are under who are under poverty uh, line were something like 28 percent now it's more like 10. now again in the last couple of years uh, it started to grow but yet it's it's a dramatic change if you look at poverty gap which is the share of total household income you need to pay to the poor to bring them up to the poverty line. So it kind of measures the poverty intensity. So this number also went down by, uh, uh, by a great amount. So it went down from six percentage points of household income to one percentage point of household income. So if actually you, you want to uh, remove poverty in Russia altogether, you just need to impose a one percentage tax on household income and give it to the poor, and that would be enough. That would be enough to uh, remove poverty altogether. And that, uh, that brings us to, uh, I, I can continue, I can talk about how middle class has benefited in terms of cars, cell phones, real estate, consumer lending, and so on. But I think uh, what is important here is that it trickled down to the very poor, it trickled down to working uh, population, trickled down to middle class. And in that sense, it's not surprising uh, that the government, for whatever uh, problems uh, and criticisms you, you could have seen, has become very popular. And uh, I'll, just, uh, I'll just show you two graphs. One is uh, my co-author, American political scientist Dan Triesman, uh, uh, actually wrote a number of paper, papers where he tracks popularity of Russian presidents and economic uh, performance. 
and basically he looks at the uh, at the uh, approval rating of uh, Mr. Putin or Mr. Yeltsin or Mr. Medvedev, and he correlates it with uh, uh, the assessment of economic situation by the Russians. And uh, what, whatever way you look at it, whatever questions of, from the questionnaires you look at, uh, these numbers are very correlated. So this is not surprising. Yes, Pierre. Uh, so it's not it's not a stronger correlation, uh, and I think his point is that uh, this is not a perfectly democratic regime, and so people usually think that popularity doesn't matter. But in those years, it looked like popularity was falling economic economic uh, uh, outcomes, and basically his point is that uh, uh, this. Uh, regime was based on the social contract where the regime delivers in economic terms and uh, and that's where popularity comes from big city population, big city population <laughs> and, uh, and countryside yeah uh, Russian government has always been uh, more popular in the countryside and in 2011 and 12, uh, the very big city, Moscow, has become very unhappy. Uh, and uh, if you actually look at wha what people were unhappy with, uh, generally their argument was economic situation is okay, we have enough incomes, but we also want good public goods which are not being delivered. And uh, in this sense, you can go back to what's called moderniza modernization theory, Lipset hypothesis, so when people become when middle class is created, when people become uh, rich, they ask for good governance. Simp not necessarily for ideological reasons, but because they want good public goods. Okay? As private consumption has gone up already. Now, this is a piece from, uh, this, is, this is something from our own research. Uh, it looks, uh, it actually looks at happiness, and this is just one graph. We, we did a number of regressions and correlations. But basically, people not only liked uh, the government, they also were generally more satisfied with life. Again, it's not, uh, it's not something that you should be surprised with. People everywhere get happier when they have more income. There is a debate in economic research whether there is a satiation effect uh, after a certain level, what's called the uh, Easterlin paradox. If uh, Americans are too rich, they start to care about relative rather than absolute income. But actually, the current uh, view in the uh, academic literature is that in the, even in the US, richer Americans are happier than poorer Americans, and it's not only relative but also absolute fact. So, but in Russia, it's also it also works. So Russians like to be richer, have higher income, and so on. Now, what happened in 2008? So in 2008, and this is something which is actually very uh, relevant for what's going on today. In 2008, there was a financial squeeze; foreign investment suddenly stopped, uh, and uh, oil prices went down. At that point, if you look at uh, uh, monthly data, oil price pretty much within half a year went down from 140 to 40. Uh, and uh, of course, Russian economy was hit. Uh, Russian government made a number of policy mistakes. In general, uh, one should say that Russian government did a good job. It also came prepared. Uh, it had more uh, money in the reserve fund, in uh, uh, foreign currency reserves, and national welfare fund that it has today. Uh, but it, it uh, decided to defend ruble. Uh, it kept ruble fixed, and uh, for a few months, uh, while this, this was done, it turned out to be very costly because, of course, financing dried up and, uh, and the nasty recession followed because nobody wanted to lend money in rubles to Russian firms. Everybody uh, knew that at some point ruble will uh, be let go, and uh, so you just need to buy dollars and sit and wait until, until that happened. And that happened, of course. Uh, so in the next uh, couple of years, uh, GDP was recovering, and so by... Uh, beginning of 2012, GDP went back to the level of uh, uh, pre-crisis. And uh, at that point, uh, the question arose, what next? What are the next, uh, what are the sources of future growth? And basically, it turned out that the pre-crisis sources of growth were exhausted and new, uh, new sources of growth uh, did, not, did not appear. And just to uh, show you this graph again, it was it was striking how quickly the growth slowed down. 
and I was I was part of uh, part of this debate. I remember there was the whole complicated tree of scenarios where people would say, well, this slowdown is uh, temporary and cyclical rather than structural. Uh, no, it's uh, caused by external problems rather than internal problems. And maybe an anti-Russia conspiracy, or maybe actually there is no agency, no conspiracy, but it's it's just global slowdown. And so there, there have been a number of number of uh, various reasons, but eventually all uh, things considered, you can see that you can cross out these boxes and come uh, come uh, to one simple conclusion, which I'll I'll, I'll tell you in a sec. Basically, what, what is important, uh, if you look at other emerging markets, unlike 2009, where everybody kind of declined, except for, uh, for China and India, uh, in 2012, 13, 14, well, other emerging markets continued to grow. Brazil was uh, more or less in trouble and still is, but Russia was singularly uh, uh, slowing down, unlike other countries. Uh, if you uh, look at the temporary and cyclical explanation. Uh, that's all, all, always nice to say that problems are temporary, fundamentals are good, but what Russia had in 2012 and 13 was completely opposite of what you would read in the textbook about cyclical slowdown. In a cyclical slowdown, in a recession, you always have less consumption than you would like to have. People save, people sit on their cash, they don't want to spend. Um, there is uh, less lending than uh, you would like to see. This is exactly the opposite of what happened in 2012, 13, and 14. Uh, consumption was actually growing very fast. It was supported by consumer lending. And at some point, uh, consumer lending actually grew by in rubles by 40% a year, by 30% a year. So it was a it was an explosion, if you like, of consumer lending, which eventually got central bank worrying. But um, I think it is also interesting that uh, just over the course uh, course of several years, Russian financial sector has become comparable in terms of retail non-mortgage consumer lending. Uh, to East European and West European countries. Mortgage lending is still very, very small. We are talking about two or three percentage points of GDP of stock of mortgage loans for the reasons that long-term financial markets are, uh, to put it mildly, uh, are in trouble. But, uh, but uh, non-mortgage lending, actually, uh, Russian, Russian banks have done a great job. Well, quality of that is a different question, but in terms of quantity, they, they did a great job. So it's not, it's not a cyclical issue. The, the decline didn't come from consumption. The decline actually came from investment. If you look at, if you look at uh, investments uh, in, real, in real, if you look at investments in real, uh, yeah, here it is, uh, in real uh, terms, you see that it went down after 2008 and actually never uh, outgrown pre-crisis level, while consumption uh, outgrew, outgrew pre-crisis level reasonably quickly. GDP also did that, so it's not it's not that uh, it's not that uh, consumption was uh, was responsible. Was investment and investment, of course, uh, was driven by factors which are not related to uh to cyclical issues or global issues these were related to poor investment climate one of the things which people also forget now when they look at stock prices today and say stock prices are low one should also remember stock prices were low even before crimea investors were taking money out stock prices were undervalued already before crimea if you look at the stock price uh, for European stocks or American stocks, you would see that they, they are trading far above 2008 levels. Russian stock price, even before Crimea, was at 50% of pre-crisis peak. And uh, if you look at the multiples, uh, they were trading at 5 or 6 uh, PE ratio. So uh, even best Russian companies would be worth five annual profits. And some Russian companies were worth uh, two annual profits, you know, Gazprom, for example, has not been known as a champion of uh, 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 shareholder value, let's put it this way. Uh, and that is actually worse than other other countries, uh, other emerging markets as well. So in that sense, in that sense, uh, 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 the, the problems have not started with Crimea. The problems have started before. It's not surprising that investment went down, capital was taken out of the country, and uh, and uh, this is uh, this is what happened. Uh, and again, 
in, in Russia, uh, you have to, to bear in mind, uh, relative to other countries which have huge sovereign debt and huge budget deficit, in Russia, budget was always, uh, 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 was always uh, done in a careful conservative way, so government did not borrow. So if you actually had capital inflow, the capital inflow would result in growing investment. It would not be crowded out by government bonds. And yet you had ca capital outflow rather than capital inflow. And capital outflow in 2011 was 4% uh, uh, was of GDP. And if you think about this, Russia if Russia managed just not to lose this capital, all this money would go into investment and would uh, change 20% of GDP investment rate to 25. That would be a completely different country. But it continued, the capital outflow continued in 2012 and 13, and so investment was falling, capital was, uh, was taken out of the country because of poor investment climate. Which in Russia is a euphemism for corruption. Uh, so. Uh, corruption is a very multifaceted p phenomenon. It's very hard to say which country is more corrupt or less corrupt. Usually people would say, well, corruption uh, corruption uh, exists everywhere. All countries are corrupt. But, uh, uh, but if you look at uh, this uh, indicator, if you actually look at any indicator, but this indicator is used uh, most of all, it's World Bank's uh, governance uh, indicator called control of corruption. So countries which are higher up here, are less corrupt, countries which are lower on this graph are more corrupt. So uh, it's not like I want to compare Russia to Denmark or Sweden on this graph. I am comparing Russia to countries of the similar level of development, of similar income level. And if you do that, you see that Russia is uh, more than one standard deviation below the trend. So it's uh, much more corrupt than countries like Poland or uh, Slovakia or Greece, for that matter, uh, and uh, if you if you have this nonlinear trend, you see that Russia is way below the trend, and uh, this is not something that people don't know. So yesterday, for example, Mr. Putin said we want to improve investment climate, and we can only improve investment climate by fighting corruption. So he's completely aware of all these things, and uh, and uh, and. Uh, government acknowledged uh, the need to do something and every few years government puts together a package of uh, impressive reforms uh, so far uh, as you see corruption has not improved uh, but you can track government thinking throughout the last 15 years uh, and uh, unfortunately as mr putin would say himself so far corruption has not been <coughs> uh, overcome and uh, in his uh, last presidential campaign, or up to date, the last presidential campaign, in uh, spring of 2012, he actually campaigned based on uh, uh, we need a new economy kind of uh, set of uh, ideas. He said uh, our, uh, we need new sources of economic growth. And for him, corruption, investment, climate were top of the agenda. And when he came into the office on May 7, 2012, he signed a, a, a series of decrees, and one of them was on, on the uh, economic policy. And in that decree, he actually uh, put together a set of reforms, uh, which include deregulation, privatization, improving business climate, and so on. Yes, Jonas. Total going on at the uh, it's a it's a good question. Uh, so there was a growing uh, sentiment that the system of what's called arbitrage courts, so business business uh, justice, was actually improving until two years ago, when this system was taken by general courts. And uh, now there is a great uh, disillusionment that uh, the quality is going down. So I cannot be optimistic. But if you asked me three years ago, I would be probably more optimistic. So, but uh, no, in, in this, so if you, if, you, if you look at quality of judiciary, if graphs like this for quality of judiciary would look very bad as well. Uh, 
so I would I would need um, objective numbers to give you, but the general feeling uh, was that uh, this arbitrage system, it was kind of a separate judiciary branch called uh, arbitration courts, arbitration court system, which was led by a uh, old uh, colleague of Medvedev, Mr. Ivanov. Uh, in Russia, everybody has a colleague named Ivanov. In this case, it was An Anton Ivanov, not Sergei Ivanov or Viktor Ivanov, colleagues of Mr. Putin. But so Anton Ivanov uh, was uh, actually praised for improving quality of business arbitration for business courts. Uh, and then a uh, couple of years ago, this, uh, this uh, branch of courts was merged into general judiciary and the kind of everyday understanding is that for businesses it actually has uh, worsened things not improved things okay so and uh, i think the main indication of uh, investment climate is capital outflow if you even before crimea capital outflow was uh, pretty high and if you think about all business opportunities in russia business people should be uh, quite worried about quality of business climate and investment climate to take their money out of Russia to the West where growth at that point was slower than in Russia and uh, business opportunities were more limited. And especially uh, that would be relevant for uh, people who live in Russia, who speak Russian, who don't read Western newspapers who, that criticize Russian business climate. So they must really uh, have, must, must have been worried about business climate. But, uh, um, I I don't have a graph like this on quality of courts, but uh, my my recollection is uh, that that would be the same graph. Yes. Question. Uh, it seems to an outsider that Mr. Putin has a lot of power. Has he tried uh, to address these issues and failed, or is he not really interested and is just giving lip service to the objective? Uh, he said he's trying. No, we had uh, we had this uh, uh, we had this meeting. Uh, I think it was 2011 uh, when uh, Minister of Economy, Minister of uh, Finance, asked me to uh, say what I think should be done, what the issues are, and so I I, I talked about these issues and uh, I said that Mr. Putin proudly said that we have very low business taxes, which at that point was true, uh, and uh, I said yes, but our business people also pay corruption tax. And uh, they, in, in addition to tax to the finance ministry, they also pay other taxes. And this is something that you can measure uh, uh, from, for example, there is a, a survey by EBRD in the World Bank called BIPS, Business uh, Environment and Enterprise Performance Survey, where you can actually ask companies how much you pay in time and money to bribe bureaucrats. And so you see that Russia is not doing well on the, in that regard. And at that point, Mr. Putin said, uh, uh, you're a person who knows, uh, who knows uh, other countries as well. You know corruption exists everywhere. And uh, he said, corruption is bad, and I promise you we will eradicate bribe taxes. Corruption will disappear. So he's aware he's trying to do that, or at least he says he's trying to do that. Okay. Uh, what 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 do you mean by lip service? I don't know. It's a it's a it's a theoretical construct which is very hard to put back to uh, facts, right? But the facts are corruption is still there. Yeah. Mr. Putin talking about eradicating corruption. See, seems to having the the fox um, guarding the hen uh, house. Uh, will we see? I mean, if you compare to to China, where you actually see actions taken in favor of corruption, will we see anything like that here in Russia? So, <coughs> uh, I think uh, uh, Karen Darbisha who wrote this book. Uh, try to do a good job. It's very hard to write books about corruption because corruption by definition is a hidden affair. I myself have seen mistakes in this book, but I think your estimate that 50% is correct. I think at least 50% is correct. So I think, I think uh, here you are. 
Now, uh, do we see uh, high-level bureaucrats going to jail in Russia? Yes, some governors are going to jail, some mayors are going to jail uh, on corruption charges. Uh, so you may say that some people are going to jail. Uh, do we see something like uh, in China or in Singapore? The answer is no. And uh, I think this uh, very set of facts and numbers I'm trying to give you, uh, the perceptions of the business people within and outside of Russia, perceptions of Russian citizens, uh, uh, capital outflow suggests that so far government either hasn't tried or has not succeeded. Okay. So, uh, and here we come, uh, in addition to all these issues, uh, which is number one on this list of perfect storm, uh, we also have uh, the uh, sanctions linked to foreign policy uh, adventures that started in 2014 and the low oil price. And a Russian economy does depend on oil price. Whatever you do, however flexible your exchange rate is, <clears throat> in 2000s, uh, uh, the benchmark number would be $10 per barrel, one percentage points of GDP, one percentage point of GDP. So if you have uh, uh, $50 per barrel change in the oil price, your growth rate should go down from 4% to minus 1%, whatever you do, something like this, or from 2% to minus 3%. Uh, and, uh, and you immediately have a fiscal problem, even if you have a flexible exchange rate. So it's <clears throat> it is a problem. Now, uh, the uh, other issue is with the sanctions, the oil price shock is much easier to, much harder, sorry, to mitigate because you don't have access to financial markets, you cannot just go and borrow and sit and wait and adjust slowly. Now you have to adjust very quickly because you, you are running out of cash. <clears throat> and uh, this is why we have 4% uh, GDP fall in uh, uh, 2015, and uh, we are uh, uh, expecting or observing 10% ch change in real wages, 10% fall in real wages, and five or six percent fall in real incomes. So um, this is a big, big shock. It's not as big as uh, uh, 1998, but for households, it's actually bigger than 2008. In 2008, GDP went down, but this was buffered by spending from the reserve fund, and uh, household incomes actually did not go down. And this is this is a big difference. So uh, Russian ruble also took a hit. A lot of people would say all oil currencies took a hit, but actually if you look at other oil currencies, they took a 20% hit while Russian ruble took a 40% hit. So it's not just the oil price, it's also sanctions that, uh, uh, that uh, drove this uh, result. It, it also is uh, due to the external debt that Russia had to repay the Russian companies and, and uh, banks had to repay, and so uh, they had to buy dollars and sell rubles, and so ruble, ruble was hit, and they could not refinance, refinance this debt because of formal or informal sanctions. Now, one of the things which happened, which is also kind of going back to uh, turbulent times, is double-digit inflation. Uh, now, the question is why Russia cannot bring uh, inflation down to reasonable levels is a very complicated question, but at least uh, before uh, recent events, inflation was 5 or 6%. Uh, the target was 5% in 2014, 4% in 2015, and so on. Uh, none of that happened. Inflation went back to double digit. Uh, in some months, it was more like 15%. The year on year in 2015 is supposed to be 12% or 13%. And uh, once you introduce new sanctions against uh, imported goods, first European and now Turkish, of course, it also contributes to uh, increase in prices. And the central bank is always careful about restricting money supply because of the effect on the real economy. So uh, it prints more money, it, it uh, lowers real interest rates. A lot of people worry about Russian interest rates being too high, but actually in real terms, <coughs> Russian interest rates are negative. Uh, central bank uh, lends at 10, 10 or 11 percent uh, uh, to banks and with inflation of 12 or 13, that is equivalent to negative real interest rates in, I don't know, Eurozone or, or United States. So um, capital flight has increased. So 
as as I said, it was three or four percent of GDP in uh, before the 2014. Now in 2014, it was 12 percent of GDP. This is a huge number. Uh, this money could have been invested in Russia. This money was taken out of Russia, repaid to Western creditors. The good news is there's, there have been no corporate defaults uh, and, of course, no sovereign defaults. Uh, all the debts were serviced, but uh, since no new money was coming in, nobody wanted to refinance this debt. It was just taken out of the country and $150 billion was net capital outflow, which was a 12% of GDP number. And uh, now, the, a year ago, people would predict $100 billion in 2015. Now, it, this estimate is down to something like $70 billion. It's still 6% uh, of GDP. It's quite a big number. Okay. Now, some good news for you. So I think the good news is uh, that uh, Russia sticks to a flexible exchange ra rate regime, which helps to buffer the shock, which helps to uh, reduce the problems at the fiscal front. Uh, that, of course, uh, impoverishes uh, the recipients of pensions and uh, state wages uh, because what government does, it doesn't index them fully, but still it helps. It helps to buffer the shock for the real economy as well. And government also understands that uh, a miracle uh, may happen, but it's not very likely. So maybe you, uh, you need to adjust for this already now. And uh, this is what uh, government is doing. So already in 2015, it cut the fiscal spending by eight percentage points in real terms uh, real, relative to the plan. And then in 2016, the current plan for 2016 budget also foresees another eight percentage point uh, real cut. And that includes eight percentage point cut in pensions. So. Uh, we know that in 2016, the Russian pensioners will have 8 percentage uh, point less purchasing power. That foresees even bigger fall in spending on education and healthcare, and it actually foresees real cut even in military spending, simply because the Russian government understands uh, that unless there is a miracle or unless oil prices go up, which some people also uh, equate to a miracle, uh, uh, money will run out at some point. Basically, no, it goes, it goes up in rubles, but rubles are not as, as powerful as before. So defense spending in 2016, in real terms, after advising, uh, adjusting for inflation, is below 2015. Okay. So in 2015, it went up. And uh, it was actually very interesting to observe that the defense sector asked to prepay the budget. So basically, uh, instead of spending uh, one twelfth of every month, uh, every month spending one twelfth of annual budget, uh, the first quarter saw half of the annual budget to be spent in the first quarter, and actually most of that in January and February, as if the defense sector knew inflation will be stronger than expected, higher than expected, and maybe government will run out of money by December. So government did not run out of money by December, but inflation is higher than expected. So it was very smart to get defense expenditures prepaid for the defense sector. Uh, but uh, in general, so there, there is a major increase in defense spending. Basically, in previous years, Russia was spending 3% of GDP. Uh, and in 2014 and 15, Russia started to spend 4% of GDP, and actually a bit more. And uh, uh, that is, uh, of course, Russian GDP in dollars shrank. So it's not a huge number. But uh, still, uh, uh, it is interesting that the cut in defense spending is much smaller in 2016 than the cut in pensions and the cut in education and healthcare. Yeah, yeah sure, sure. But in rubles, it also it also goes down. Yes, in real rubles, in real rubles. Yeah, yeah. No, but uh, in many in many cases, people just compare dollar value of defense spending. So Russia is not a world champion in, in dollar value. Yeah. So, um, but it does spend uh, a very high share. So think about that. In NATO countries, the benchmark is two percent of GDP. Russia is spending four. And. Uh, mm -hmm. Cutting pensions, isn't that a very politically sensitive question for the political power? 
That's a very good question. So, and that's why before it hasn't happened. But uh, if you don't have money, you need to choose something, right? In, uh, in uh, Russia, uh, there is this joke Then, when vodka prices go up, father comes back home and uh, tells son, vodka, prices, vodka price went up again, and, uh, and son says, father, does that mean that uh, you will drink less? And the, the father says, no, that means that you will eat less, right? So if you have budget constraints, you cannot ignore them. And basically the plan is, even with those cuts, even with those cuts, uh, reserve fund will, uh, will be cut by half by the end of 2016, which means if there are no further cuts in 2017, uh, reserve fund will be gone by the end of 2017. Okay? And uh, that probably means there will be further cuts in 2017. That also explains why Russia abandoned the practice of preparing three-year budgets. This is something that has been a pride of Russian finance ministry that they had whatever 10-year strategy, 15-year strategy, and also put on paper a three-year budget plan. This year they said, no more. We prepare one-year budget for 2016. Uh, we will give you no numbers for 2017 and 19. That may answer your question. Probably they don't want to project further cuts and publish them now. Yes, Caroline. They, didn't, they don't seem to target any particular level uh, uh, regarding the inflation, and they still maintain a flexible exchange rate. So what is the basis for monetary policy right now? I mean, if, if there's no nominal anchor anywhere, and inflation is picking up like this, um, and uh, on the government side, they don't want to um, publish a multiple-year budget, um, it's a little bit difficult to see, um, to, for people to project what's going to happen in the future? Uh, it is difficult to project, uh, <laughs> especially the future. <laughs> so they say it's very difficult to make forecasts, especially about the future. Uh, the central bank does have an inflation target, but after it uh, missed it by something like 10 percentage points, uh, credibility is questioned. Okay. Formally, central bank says we are on floating exchange rate regime, inflation targeting. The problem is that credibility is uh, shattered. So if you ask central bank today, they will tell you inflation in 2018 will be 4 percentage points. Actually, inflation in 2017 will be something like 4 percentage points or 5 percentage points. Nobody believes that. Even though central bank has these instruments, uh, uh, it's been under political pressure to keep interest rates low and so on. And occasionally, the central bank also makes um, those statements that they also want to target uh, industrial production, or uh, some in some way they also want to uh, target uh, exchange rate. So there is some confusion. A year ago, central bank was actually very clear that we target inflation inflation rate. But again, what happened after they missed inflation rate for a couple of years by a huge margin, they they lost uh, credibility. And I have a lot of respect for Russian Central Bank. Don't get me wrong. I mean, uh, you asked about corruption. There is no question that top Russian Central Bankers are not corrupt. They are not corrupt. Uh, about the calendar for the Reserve Fund, uh, on what basis is that done in terms of the oil price? On the current oil price. On the 50. P45.50. Yeah. So if oil price goes up, it will last longer. If go oil price goes down, it will uh, be emptied short, uh, sooner. Okay. Uh, now, one other interesting uh, element, and we discussed that with Jonas before the talk, um, uh, is this external debt. So sovereign debt is very, very low. It's something like 13, 15 percent of GDP. But then there is also bank and corporate debt, including quasi-sovereigns like Gazprom, Rosneft, and what have you which two years ago was above $700 billion. And so people were extremely worried about this. Uh, but uh, what, what has happened, this amount was brought down to something like 520 by now. It wasn't uh, without turbulence, because uh, I'm not sure which exactly article uh, NFT pair had in mind, but uh, in one of those articles I was describing one of the interesting episodes when Russian ruble went down by 30% within uh, a day or two. And a lot of people link it 
uh, to a situation where Rosneft had to repay the loan, and that's why Central Bank uh, did a special transaction through another unnamed state bank. And so uh, that's at least how markets interpreted it, and that's when markets panicked and uh, ruble went down to levels which have not seen before and uh, actually are not there now as well. It rebounded. But basically, to repay those uh, loans, Russian uh, companies would buy dollars that would be, uh, would uh, uh, weaken the ruble. Uh, Central Bank also used its reserves to allow Russian companies uh, and banks to smoothen the shock. So first of all, Central Bank sold a lot of dollars to Russian companies and uh, uh, and banks. And so reserves went down from 500 to 370 uh, where they are now. And second, Central Bank also lend money to Russian banks so they could lend dollars to Russian companies uh, so Russian companies could repay. And so uh, uh, in that sense, this transition was uh, managed reasonably well, in, in, except for a few turbulent episodes. And basically, and basically right now the debt is something like 500. It's not a, a small amount. It's kind of half of annual GDP. Uh, but it's not going to be a disaster next year or year after next. Now, it is different from what happened before 2014, when you have a debt, but you also have inflow of capital which refinances this debt. But uh, this is where, yeah. Yes, yes, ma'am. So, <clears throat> why are um, uh, Russian companies and the central bank so keen on paying back the foreign debt, given that the foreigners are not lending to them? That's a very good question. They're very keen. They don't want to default, and the reason is, if I default, you take away my oil tankers. So, that's uh, Russia depends on export revenues. Export revenues are easily uh, expropriatable. So, yeah. So it's, uh, I mean, one thing is Yukos shareholders who have their court decision to take 50 billion dollars from Russian government running around this is one story but if you if you stop re if Rosneft doesn't repay to a uh, European bank a, this European bank will grab Rosneft's oil, oil, oil tankers so, yeah. so that is I think I think this is kind of clear and and Russian companies have paid every single loan so far yeah uh, what will happen to the Russian financial system in this crisis will it spur consolidation and increase of state ownership uh, yes, uh, the short answer is yes. So there are two waves. One, the central bank is actually very courageous in closing down uh, money laundering operations, which are called banks in, in Russia. So uh, something like 300 banks have been closed in the last three years. Uh, and uh, and I, I, when I say courageous, I mean courageous because one person who's been doing that was killed in 2006. The deputy chair of the central bank was fighting uh, money laundering operations and was physically killed, right, for this. And uh, <clears throat> and so the, the people who are doing that now are indeed brave. Uh, but uh, uh, then the, there is also consolidation because banks go under. Uh, central bank lends money to banks which are afloat to uh, restructure the businesses of uh, failing banks. And so consolidation is happening. And on top of that, state ownership is going up because state banks, which are by definition explicitly and implicitly backed by the state, are more stable. So they take over collateral. And so state banks are becoming big owners in the Russian economy. And uh, in Russia, as you can imagine, out of the top 10 banks, uh, whatever, seven or eight are state, and the top three state banks control majority of banking assets. So it's, uh, it's quite an issue. And some some banks some state banks are very good uh some state banks are not very good okay. so uh which this is actually a very interesting question because in europe you know there is a banking union and the reason for creating banking union in europe is to delink the sovereign debt from banking debt because we used to have this vicious circle where banks would hold government bonds so when government is in trouble banks are in trouble so government needs to bail them out. So government bonds are now in trouble. And so you have this vicious circle. And so uh, a bank, banking union allows to delink that, uh, to break this chain. In Russia, they are now actually going in the opposite direction when they recapitalize banks with uh, state bonds. 
which uh, may create a vicious circle in some, at some point, which I think we should all worry about. But at the moment, so sovereign, sovereign Russian sovereign debt is trading below investment grade, but it's still not close to default. Okay. Uh, so, um, so what what is the forecast? So as Carolina said, it's very hard to project. <laughs> so even now there is quite a disagreement of what the GDP growth in 2015 will be. And uh, what to say about the future? Future is even more uncertain. Official forecast in Russia is always uh, more optimistic. Uh, uh, but international organizations all assume that there'll be a continuing recession next year. Again, based on current oil price. Uh, and um, uh, uh, EBRD is uh, more negative than World Bank or IMF, but also EBRD produced a uh, forecast one month later. So it's a November forecast, while uh, IMF and World Bank did it in October and September. So uh, maybe EBRD is just closer to the to the current events. Uh, and uh, then uh, longer term forecast is stagnation, growth of 1% or 1.5% per year. Even optimistic governments forecasts uh, for C2% a year, which is, of course, a disappointment because Russia, to catch up with developed countries, needs to grow faster. And if you go back to the economy minister's speech, speeches in 2013, that's the very same economy minister who's optimistic about 2%. Now, at that point, he said, we are really in trouble, economy is stagnating, we are very likely to grow just at 3% per year. Now, 3% per year now looks as an uh, unachievable target. And, uh, and in, that sense, in that sense, we should all worry, worry about this. Now, uh, how government will avoid further tax before 2018 is not clear. Should be some kind of increase in oil prices, should be some kind of productivity miracle. Uh, I don't know. But uh, currently, numbers are such that uh, if there are no further budget cuts by the end of 2017, uh, reserve fund will be exhausted. Uh, so that probably means further cuts and then the political questions appear. To what extent uh, Russian public will gladly accept further falling incomes, uh, income levels. And we see some protests, but currently it looks like uh, uh, the social contract which persisted in 2000s when uh, you support the government because your income is growing, uh, is now different. You support the government because uh, uh, Crimea is part of Russia, even if incomes are not growing. So this is this is where we are. Once once again, I would like to would rather like to give you a more optimistic picture. Uh, I would like to give you more certainty about the future. But I think we are both in a in a mode where the next two or three years are very uncertain, and not uh, very optimistic. But on the uh, other hand, I, I should say that in the long run, I remain optimist on Russia. I think Russia in the long run uh, will be a prosperous, democratic and European country. Thank you. So, uh, in Soviet economy, they didn't have inflation. <laughs> yeah, I just said Soviet economy. <laughs> it's a Russian economy where they do have inflation, which I think is good. It's better to come to a shop and buy expensive stuff than to come to a shop and buy no stuff. and have no stuff in the shop. Uh, but uh, no, I think if inflation continues, it helps the government to solve the budget problem because it, inflation tax is, uh, is a hidden tax which, uh, which uh, is imposed on whoever holds cash rubles, right? And wh whoever's uh, salaries are not indexed fully. The government seems to think this way. That's why inflation is stuck, uh, high. I think in every country, inflation is actually politically problematic, politically dangerous. Uh, and this is what politicians, especially uh, econ economic policy makers don't fully understand. This is actually a very interesting issue because uh, top politicians usually don't go to stores and they judge inflation by uh, numbers. And numbers are good because the higher inflation is, the, the higher the inflation, the better the fiscal numbers, right? And, uh, and uh, the Mr. Putin actually has made a number of statements saying, uh, look, weaker ruble is actually good because when we sell oil, we get more rubles, right? Uh, that's what he said. Uh, and uh, 
but um, I think people who do go to the stores are very unhappy uh, about higher prices. And uh, what people usually also underestimate is when you go to a store, uh, your psychological model, whatever is what's called fast thinking model, reacts to big changes in prices, not to prices which remain stable. So you walk to a store and you see computers are, have the same price, but uh, butter is more expensive, say 20% more expensive. So you walk away and you say butter is now 20% more expensive, inflation is 20%, while the official number is whatever, 5%. And so uh, you walk around and tell this uh, outrageous fact that prices went up by 20%. So this is something which is psychologically uh, very important, but is not noticed by uh, finance ministry officials in any country, I should say. But uh, Russia stands out because inflation rates are much higher, and they're especially high for food and for imported drugs and so on and so forth. And so the poorest Russians and the oldest Russians who uh, spend a lot on food and on uh, pharmaceutical products, they, of course, are affected most. So I think this is, this is a very dangerous route, Jonas. I, I would not recommend to keep inflation at 15% if I were to advise Russian government. What do you think has been the impact of the sanction imposed on Russia from the EU and the US? And also uh, now uh, the situation concerning Turkey and uh, the sanction that Russia has put on Turkey that also will, uh, th I think, <coughs> have an impact on the Russian economy. So uh, uh, the sanctions uh, reinforced the impact of the oil price. Uh, going down because Russia is cut from financial markets. That was initially the understanding that Russia would be able to borrow from China, that China will bail Russia out, and this is what's not happened. It is not happened. China has enough money to solve all Russian problems, but it hasn't done that. And I, I can talk uh, long why it's, uh, it was the case, but it's not, it's not happened. And so sanctions played a very important role. Uh, because Russian companies, Russian banks now are cash constrained. Uh, so some people would say that sanctions have not changed Russian foreign policy. Uh, I think that depends on what the counterfactual is. If the counterfactual were um, that more parts of Ukraine would become part of Russia, uh, then you see that this has not happened to. So, Crimea has become part of Russia. Donetsk and Lugansk, for whatever atrocities are there, are still part of Ukraine. And the Russian government strongly believes that this is a part of Ukraine and continues to say that this is, this is going to be part of Ukraine. So in that sense, you can, uh, again, you don't, we don't have a randomized control trial. It's not like we randomly signed uh, sanctions and uh, interv uh, military interventions to different parts of Ukraine. But you see uh, Crimea, moved quickly into Russia, sanctions were late, uh, Crimea is part of Russia and is not going back. Sanctions were introduced after Crimea and then in Crimea there was a referendum, a week later Crimea is part of Russia, in Donetsk it was a referendum, Russia didn't recognize this referendum, didn't do anything. In Donetsk it was an election in November 2014, Russia said we respect your elections but we don't recognize them. And, uh, and uh, currently Russia says we uh, will stick to Minsk agreements, whether it happens or not, but uh, there is no debate that uh, Russia will annex uh, Donetsk and Lugansk. This is off the agenda for now. Now, as for counter sanctions, sanctions uh, embar uh, which embargoed European imports and now Turkish imports, they are a big part of the story. Big increase in inflation in summer 2014 uh, was driven by the fact that Russia introduced sanctions against European products. This is uh, what uh, what economic theory would tell you, especially if central bank doesn't act quickly and aggressively against inflation. And uh, so this is what we observed. Turkey is a very important trading partner, but Russia is now more careful. It says, we will not introduce uh, sanctions overnight. We will not introduce sanctions over everything we import from Turkey. But if they move as uh, broadly as they did with the European Union, that may be a major contributor to inflation. Yeah. So, and in general, that also will make people poorer and uh, uh, reduce uh, their choice in terms of consumption. 
both food and uh, resort destinations. Now, I should say, I should tell you that Egypt and Turkey are the top two tourist destinations for Russians. We are talking about three million one place and two million in other place per year. Next place, Greece, is something like one and a half million or one million, and now Egypt is gone, and so now Turkey will be gone. So, so, so it's a big change. Yeah, so uh, one of the narratives is, since China is not coming to the rescue, uh, Russia will uh, uh, substitute imports. And uh, the, uh, uh, the problem here is uh, import substitution will happen because ruble is weak, so Russians cannot afford imports. So some import substitution will happen for sure. Uh, but uh, if we think about creating high-quality manufacturing industry, uh, you need uh, new technology, you need investment from the West, and this is what sanctions don't allow to do. And one very big issue, it's not directly related to import substitution, but one very big issue is oil production. New, field, uh, new fields require American technology, let's put it uh, bluntly. And this was planned all the way before 2014, and then sanctions cut Russia from accessing American technology for difficult fields. So oil production may start declining in a couple of years. And um, and for other things, well, as I said, some import substitution will happen, but isolation doesn't really uh, bring good news about import substitution. You need technology, you need foreign investment, and this is what's not happened. Foreign direct investment uh, went down by pretty much order of magnitude. So uh, we think of them as reliable in the sense that people are not afraid to say that they support the president. So there are experiments now. So there is a political scientist from Columbia University, Tim Fry, who does what's called list experiments uh, when it's not just they ask, uh, uh, do you support Putin? Uh, they play very sophisticated uh, psychological games where people look at lists of various politicians and so on, and that in a tricky way allows to allows you to figure out whether you uh, whether people actually like or dislike Putin. And it turns out that people generally people who say they support Putin they do support Putin. So it's not about um, uh, fear to tell the pollsters that we don't support the government. It may be related to the information Russians have access to. So it, it mo it's more more about. Uh, the news that they get, the news that they don't get, and uh, and that may explain the poll numbers. But yes, at this at this at this point, uh, uh, we should think uh, of these numbers as reliable. Yeah. There are two. There, there there are several. First, it is small. Second, a lot of people left. Uh, we don't know how many people left because statistics still believe that I live in Moscow. For, uh, for purposes of Russian statistics, I fully live in Moscow. Uh, and uh, uh, another thing is a lot of people in the middle class uh, have come to terms with the uh, developments and have rationalized the developments for themselves. And uh, in a sense, they, they created a mental model which explains why Russia is doing what it's doing. So if you go back to Moscow today, you will see that some people to whom it, for you it w was easy to talk five years ago would be now harder to talk. So some of them have changed their views because it's very hard to have everyday cognitive dissonance. It's very hard to live every day and uh, uh, be unhappy about the environment in which you live in. So you, you people usually create a mental model that, that justify or rationalize the environment in which they live in. Um, you've stressed the importance of oil. Um, if I were a policymaker in Russia, I would uh, find it very important to try to broaden the economy. Yeah. Are there any, uh, or what non-commodity sectors are there to be hopeful about? So, uh, in principle, yes, but you also have countries like Norway, Australia, Canada, commodity exporters that live well, right? So. Nothing prohibits oil con countries to, from, from being developed, rich, prosperous, democratic, and so on. But uh, 
I think the general answer to your question is um, if you have good political institutions, if corruption is under control, if financial system is developed, which also requires courts and so on, then uh, we will see which sectors will develop quickly. And uh, uh, people usually under, underestimate um, the fact that Russia has a very vibrant knowledge-based sector, which now is declining, of course. But before recent events, it was growing really fast. Russia was one of the top venture capital destinations in, uh, in uh, Europe. And Russia had and still has global world-class IT companies. And uh, Russia is the only country, except for China, but China has done that in a different way. Russia is the only country where Google is not dominant in internet search, right? Because Russian own Russian company is so good. Russia had a domestic competitor to Facebook, which was successfully competing uh, with Facebook until the owner was kicked out. And now he runs another business in Europe, which is an encrypted messenger, which also shows that this entrepreneur is uh, quite an amazing person that he started from scratch and built a, a messenger for 70 million people. Uh, so there are, there are interesting developments. And uh, if, you go back to, if you go back to 1990s, people would say Russian agriculture is a black hole. Uh, I remember uh, agricultural minister saying the country should feed its peasants. That's, that's the way he put it. Uh, now agri Russia become a big grain exporter. Russia has a lot of fertile land. After land code was introduced, Russian agriculture started to grow. And in that sense, uh, you see growth in many, in many places. Transportation will grow. Service sector has grown and should grow further because in Soviet economy, services were under-delivered. So in that sense, I'm, I'm very optimistic that Russia can grow many, many sectors. Uh, there are many issues that Russia faces, there are many challenges, but we shouldn't think that uh, Russia cannot develop uh, non-oil business. America now produces more oil than Russia. Why don't we think about America as a non-oil country? Because conditions are right for non-oil businesses as well. Financial system, court system, uh, relatively low corruption compared to Russia. So it's, uh, it's uh, something that you need to develop so other sectors can grow too. Another question, or we need? Yeah. Um, uh, what do you think about uh, uh, the talk of um, um, the military industry or and uh, arms expert as a driver, uh, driving for locomotive for the economy? Putin has talked about that too. Yeah, I think uh, many people go back to Soviet times and think that uh, military sector can generate productivity growth. Uh, development of innovation and so on. I think uh, we are past this era. Uh, I think uh, now it is the military who uses civilian innovation. So American pilots, military pilots use iPads rather than iPads are being developed within the military, right? So uh, this is because uh, big multinational companies are more successful, they operate in more competitive environment, they bring uh, in more human capital. And I think in Russia, that works the same way, because if you're a top-notch engineer or researcher, uh, you can still leave. And that's a big difference between Russia and Soviet Union, where you could not leave. And so if you want to do research at the global level, you probably want to be outside of Russia, if Russia is isolated. So in that sense, I don't see this story how military sector becomes the productivity driver. Uh, experts will be there. Russian military sector still produces world-class equipment. But in the sense that military sector will produce uh, high quality jobs, innovation, and so on, we've not seen that. And we are very unlikely to see that. Uh, as long as people are allowed to leave. If people are not allowed to leave, that's a different story. But this is what Russia doesn't want to do. We clearly see that Russian government is committed to allowing people who are unhappy to leave and be unhappy outside, uh, rather than to keep them inside so they're unhappy inside and try to change things. So I think this is a very clear message that uh, today's government is not as, as uh, conservative in that sense as Soviet government. Could I ask you one thing? I was yes. thinking about the nature of the capital outflow. Yeah. Uh, sort of visit, I guess it's a mixture of Western capital or companies withdrawing and 
Russian capital owners moving their investments outside. Do we know anything about the mix of so right now of the capital as, we, as, as we speak right now, what happens? Russian companies repay their loans, okay, and no money comes in. But some of these loans are repaid to Russian offshore comp uh, offshore companies outside of Russia owned by Russians. So if uh, I am a Russian entrepreneur, sometimes I set up an offshore company in Bahamas or Cyprus or Netherlands and uh, I lend money to my Russian subsidiary from this subsidiary. So when time comes to take money out, it just looks like my Russian subsidiary just repays a loan. Mm -hmm. and nobody asks any questions. So this is, this is the nature, the, f the technological nature of capital outflow. Uh, are foreign companies taking money out? Well, it's, if you're a foreign direct investor, you can't really take a plant out. You can sell it, mm -hmm. and some, some, some transactions like this are happening. Russian government forced uh, all foreign media investors to sell. There is a special law which says media cannot be owned by foreigners. Uh, Stockman is actually selling. Uh, IKEA is staying. Uh, so um, no, it's it's very hard to sell now. I, if you talk about financial investors, uh, so some banks are selling their Russian subsidiaries. Uh, if if you talk about financial uh, investors in the stock market, everybody has sold long time ago. Mm. So everybody's gone. But I think, I think it is important that Russian investors also take their money out. So a lot of people would say, of course, foreign investors come to talks like this or read Financial Times on The Economist, and Russia is very negatively portrayed there. Uh, most of money taken out of Russia are taken, uh, taken out by people who don't read Financial Times. They just think that they need to vote with their feet, and uh, that's how it happens. It's a, it's a good question because uh, in some uh, there are examples when that happened but as we speak now there is a special capital amnesty so if you bring money back uh, you will not be prosecuted whatever whatever way you took money out and we see that only a few hundred people use this capital amnesty in the last year and a half and we also see that uh, a lot of people did not bring money back but there is a rumor we don't know whether this rumor is true or not that a very uh, long uh, long time colleague of him the ceo of russian railroads was fired exactly because he didn't w want to bring money back and his son didn't want to bring money back and his son doing a lot of business with the russian railroads applied for uh, british citizenship and continued to live in london so maybe there is a there is uh, some rationale behind it but that's a rumor we we don't know Okay, we have run out of time. This was one of those wonderful seminars that didn't need a moderator, wasn't it? I mean, that was sort of immediate contact between audience and the presenter, and we enjoyed that very much. Thank, Thank you very much. You very much. Thank you, Per. Thank you. Thank you.